So, introductory neuroscience and neuroinstrumentation, electrophysiological recordings. Hello and welcome to an overview of types of electrophysiological recordings. Uh, that is what I will be dealing with in this uh, relatively short session. So, um, neurons are electrical in function, uh, that is what we have gathered so far, and thus their electrical activity, if we can record it, it reflects neuronal function. Now, there are different types of uh, electrophysiolo electrophysiological recordings. You have intracellular recordings where you have a glass microelectrode inside the cell recording changes in membrane potential or current like so. And then you have extracellular uh, recordings where the electrode is outside the cell and there you get the extracellular activity of the cell and it is called units or spikes. Now, this can be really close to the cell it can be on the surface of the brain uh, electrocorticogram or it can be a EEG electroencephalogram where you record from the scalp, uh, the skin, the bone and then through all that you sense the electrical activity. So, electrocorticograms and EEG we will discuss in future sessions. So, uh, let us talk about the actual techniques, the microelectrodes which you need to record. The most commonly used variety of electrodes are glass capillary microelectrodes like here and uh, here you have a glass capillary tube and one part is heated and pulled so that the tip becomes you know uh, in the micron uh, 10 micron range. Now, that is filled with a high molar potassium chloride solution to give electrical conductivity to a silver silver chloride wire which goes to the electronics. So, at the tip you have uh, electro diameters at the micron level, it could be 1 micron, 5, 10, so on and so forth. Alternatively, you could use metal microelectrodes. So, typically the metals used are tungsten, platinum, nichrome and stainless steel uh, because they are all very stiff. So, uh, here you electro point, you pass uh, AC current for example, through the electrode and it connects with the circuit and with that you can uh, make very fine uh, tips you know at the micron level and you have the metal uh, you know it is insulated with something suitable like um, uh, foam war and uh, only the tip is exposed. So, the glass and the metal microelectrodes are the workhorses of neurophysiology they have been with us for the last 50, 100 years. Lately, you have you know something called solid state uh, electrodes which can be actually fabricated from silicon substrates and this allows us to you know uh, fabricate electrodes depending on the structure of the neuro neurons, the structure of the neuronal uh, area we are recording from. Uh, in fact, uh, this is being done at Institute of Science in Professor Hardik Pandya's lab. So, uh, let us uh, consider intracellular recordings. So, typically you have a cell, you have a, a microelectrode which we showed uh, a glass microelectrode that impales the cell and then between inside and outside you record the potential. So, the microelectrode is connected through the silver silver chloride wires to a microelectrode amplifier and then it goes to the signal conditioning circuits which either record the voltage or the currents. So, when you do this uh, as soon as you insert the electrode inside the cell you get a potential. Now, this potential is typically minus 60 to minus 80 uh, millivolts uh, with respect to the outside. So, when there is uh, activity of the nerve, uh, we call it the action potential which we will study in depth in a future session, it can reach up to 40 uh, millivolts plus 40 millivolts. So, Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley did a series of uh, seminal experiments in the 40s and the 50s where they developed new techniques to find out the mechanism of generation of the action potential. For this they won the Nobel Prize in 1963. So, these intracellular electrodes from the giant were uh, used from the giant axon of the squid. So, this is a squid you know it is a deep sea dwelling uh, creature and we are not really interested in it except in these two giant axons. Now, these are very big uh, you know and they are the largest in the animal kingdom uh, uh, nothing bigger has been uh, shown. They are 1 millimeter in diameter and this allows us this uh, dimensions of this axon 
uh, allows us to put an insert a glass uh, microelectrode inside as you see over here and the circuit is what we showed uh, this is a simplified version of the circuit shown in the previous slide where you have the electrode inside the axon and uh, then you have the signal conditioning circuit and the ground electrode will be outside in the extracellular fluid. So this is the original recording. Uh, this part over here is where the electrode has been inserted into the axon and then a, a little bit of current is in, uh, injected into the circuit and then it has an action potential. So this is the resting membrane potential and this is the action potential and this is highly dependent on intracellular potassium. The way they proved it was they did a very elegant experiment. They rolled out the cytoplasm using a road roller and they uh, reperfused the axon with a high potassium uh, solution. And lo and behold, this is the uh, action potential, the resting membrane potential and the action potential with the intact axon. And this is the resting membrane potential and action potential with the reperfused uh, axon, reperfused with high potassium. So this uh, brings out a very important point that the action potential and the membrane potential of the axon, it's due to the potassium and the ionic concentration and the other subcellular components of the cell, if you will. They are not really involved in generation of the resting membrane and the action potential. Okay. So these experiments were crucial in understanding the mechanism of action potential generation in neurons. So further, they developed, uh, Hodgkin and Huxley developed a voltage clamp uh, technique uh, which is a variation of the intracellular recording. Here we have the electrode inside and we clamp the cell at a particular voltage, a command voltage it is called and at that voltage with the appropriate signal conditioning circuit, we record how much current crosses the membrane. Now remember this is ionic current uh, in biology, in neurophysiology, charges are trans transferred by ions and not by electrons. So many ionic channels in the membrane are voltage gated which means they open only at a particular range within a certain range and uh, this is you know uh, a schematic of the cell membrane. So you have the phospholipid layer uh, cell membrane which we studied earlier and that acts as a capacitor and then studded in the phospholipid C as it were, you have these icebergs, uh, ionic channels floating and that at a particular voltage range opens and that acts as a conductor. So uh, when uh, we clamp the axon at a particular voltage, enough current has to be injected uh, to balance uh, this command voltage by charging its cell membranes. So a patch clamp is another variation of intracellular recordings. Here the cell is not penetrated. The microelectrode uh, using a suction apparatus is patched to a bit of cell membrane which has the uh, channel uh, of interest. And uh, then the you know you have the usual electronics and here you see the current at rest. When the channel is closed you have this baseline and then we use Pico spritz uh, appropriate neurotransmitter on the channel, the channel opens and it either opens or it closes pretty quantal in that way. So you can see it closed and then uh, it opens, then it is closed again, then it is open so on and so forth. Okay. Alternatively the whole cell uh, uh, you know membrane potential and currents can be recorded uh, by clamping uh, the whole cell without uh, uh, focusing on a single patch or a single ion. Uh, this gives recordings equivalent to intracellular recordings of the cell with the advantage that the cell is not damaged because when you impale something there is damage and then the life of the cell uh, you know recording uh, life it gets low. So when you patch the whole cell you can record for longer periods of time. So that was uh, all intracellular recordings. So now let us consider extracellular recordings. As we had mentioned here the electrode is very close to the neuronal tissue. It is not inside the neuronal tissue and um, it is just as adjacent to it. So if it is about 1 mu, you know 1 micron the electrode tip, it would record the activity of an adjacent cell and that is called a spike or a single unit. Now these are very similar to intracellular action potentials but much smaller, typically only about 1 millivolt but they can be picked up. And many, many experiments, thousands of experiments in fact uh, in animals, in conscious and anesthetized animals have used this technique. 
simply because this is a much more robust technique uh, in the sense that the animal can move and you can still record the spikes. If it's inside the cell and it's even slight movement, then you know either the nerve gets damaged or the uh, uh, electrode slips out of the cell. So there are certain advantages of extracellular recording. So uh, if it is slightly larger, uh, you know maybe about 5 or 10 uh, microns, then you start getting you know multiple uh, unit activity, activity of units which are you know uh, you don't you can't distinguish individual units but you see a population of units. So these are recordings from the auditory cortex of a monkey and uh, this was the electrode which was used uh, which is a linear array of 15, uh, 16 microelectrodes uh, separated by 100 mu and it's called the Barna electrode and this records multi-unit activity and if it's, f if it's bigger still and if you change the filter settings then you record local field potentials. This is the uh, field potentials recorded when an ensemble or a neuronal circuit gets activated. So here you see uh, the Barna electrode being used to record uh, activity in the auditory cortex of the monkey, in the auditory area, uh, the response to a tone and you can actually see the tone over here, the tone is a 100 millisecond tone and these are the different uh, areas, uh, layers of the cortex which we should deal with sub subsequently but this is a local field potential. So uh, the final kinds of recordings that we will consider are you know uh, monophasic recordings. So here uh, these are a variation of extracellular recordings where different groups of nerve fibers conduct at different rates and we can see that using this particular technique. So a little bit of history, uh, amplifiers and oscilloscopes are standard equipment in neurophysiology. So in the uh, old days you had uh, equipment like this and they were all based on uh, valves, uh, radio valves and tubes and uh, cathode ray oscilloscopes. Uh, now of course you have solid state uh, you know, uh, mechanism, uh, methods and you also have uh, computers instead of uh, oscilloscopes but the fundamental principles remain the same. So here the electrical activity in the nerves can be timed to sub millisecond precision and it was to uh, Joseph Erlanger and Herbert Gasser. Uh, we owe this, uh, these uh, increased in instrumentation uh, advances and uh, they applied it immediately to uh, looking at the electrical activity in peripheral nerves. So, and they found that you know uh, a peripheral nerve has different populations of uh, neurons, a sensory nerve. It has populations for pain, it has populations of nerves for temperature, pressure, cold, so on and so forth. And uh, when they used this technique, they found that they could uh, discern these populations easily. And uh, uh, for this work, they won the Nobel Prize in 1944. So what is the monophasic killed end recording? So this is a potential which is recorded when a nerve impulse approaches but never passes beyond the recording site. So here you have a stimulus, this is the nerve and this is the recording site and typically in a biphasic recording way up and down the electrical activity comes here and then goes here in the opposite direction so you have a biphasic response. But if you crush the nerve in between and that's why you get the name killed end recording you only get half of it which is a monophasic response and this is a monophasic response which uh, Gaston and Langer uh, used. So uh, on the right over here are monophasic responses from a cat dorsal column which is on the spinal cord and this is from my thesis where I was looking at uh, the activity of the sensory columns to trauma and uh, this is still uh, you know an important technique which can be used experimentally. So thank you, uh, in the next session we shall consider neurocortical circuits.